Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Bristol. And we're here today to interview a very special guest, Professor David Miller, who was sacked just a few days ago by the University of Bristol after complaints from Jewish students who accused him of targeting and harassing them. Now, David obviously is a non-Muslim, but this subject is the talk of the town in the Muslim community as well, because it has massive implications for Muslims, Arabs, and Palestinian students as well. So let's take a listen to what David Miller had to say. Well, I mean, I, I kind of anticipated this was going to happen to me. Um, the, the way in which the, the investigation was handled was, in my view, um, uh, not very appropriate. And uh, so I, was, I kind of thought that, 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 that the act was going to fall. So I was slightly prepared, but, you know, when you come to the end of a very long academic career, just like that, in a number of minutes, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a dramatic thing to happen to you. And so I suppose I'm still working out how I feel about that, but it, I, I am obviously pretty cross and angry about it because, uh, you know, I think it's pretty clear from all the evidence that's in, in the public domain already that I've done nothing at all wrong. All I've done is point to the campaign against me by Zionist organisations on campus uh, and also made comments about uh, my views on what Zionism is, which is a, a settler colonial uh, form of racism. It's a, a racist ideology and uh, we're living in a, an age in the world when racism is thought to be a bad thing and uh, should be uh, eliminated according to the statements of our of the University of Bristol itself. So I, I, you know, I feel kind of that, uh, that I'm simply being uh, removed because there are uh, pro-Israel organisations who disagree with my political views. What issue did you have with the investigation? Well, I, I didn't. I, I can't really go into detail about that. But the, the investigation didn't seem to me to be adequate, uh, and the judgments based on that investigation, therefore, are, are also uh, not adequate. I, I mean, that, that the full details of that will have to wait for another time. But what I can say is that uh, the, the uh, QC's report, which was commissioned by the university and which the university said had concluded that none of my comments were unlawful, actually went further than that. And it said explicitly that my comments were not anti-Semitic and it would not engage the Equality Act 2010 in any way. So it, I've got a very clear, um, uh, clean bill of health in relation to the question of anti-Semitism, which of course you would expect because of course I'm not an anti-Semite, I'm an anti-Zionist. Uh, and yet the university felt able to, on, on that basis, to to get to get rid of me, so that that's a you know that's a problematic thing it seems to be. And many people have picked this up on Twitter and started to ask questions about well, if he's been found so that his comments were lawful and were not anti-Semitic, what on earth can he be have been sacked for? Yeah, so let me read out some of the accusations, um, sure. and you can respond, uh, David. So basically, I guess the accusation is from uh, Jewish students at Bristol University and the wider Jewish community um, that you're anti-Semite. Um, you've said that there's an onslaught by the government of Israel to impose its views on the world. Uh, the university, Bristol University Jewish societies and, and the, the, you know, they, they're directed by Israel. They're part of the Zionist movement, which is the enemy of world peace. It must be targeted. And the goal is to defeat Zionism, uh, to end Zionism. Your response to that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I mean, it's not it's not Jewish students who who have complained about me. It's a specific organisation called the Bristol Jewish Society, uh, and and the, the leadership of that organisation. It's not Jewish students in general. I haven't made no no comments about Jewish students in general. I have made comments about the, the Jewish Society of Bristol and about its relationship with the Union of Jewish Students, which is the British national organisation, which is itself a former a formal member of the Zionist movement. So uh, this is not a question about. Uh, Jews or about uh, the politics of the Jews, it's about Zionism and uh, the, 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 nobody denies that the Union of Jewish Students is a formal member of the Zionist movement it's a, and, and it's, it's, me, mem, its membership is through the World Union of Jewish Students of which it's a constituent part, it has a seat on the executive of the World Union of Jewish Students and the World Union of Jewish Students is in turn of course uh, a direct member of the World Zionist Organization and thus gets uh, uh, delegates to the, the supreme uh, uh, decision-making body of the, the World Zionist Organization, which is the World Zionist Congress. So uh, these are simply matters of fact, right? Uh, now, when I, when I talked about um, Zionism as is, is an ideology which means to be ended and targeted, etc., of course, well, I mean, Zionism is a form of racism. It's a, 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 an ideology which has been used to justify the ethnic cleansing of Palestine in uh, 1948, indeed before 
1948 when, when the first settlement started uh, and indeed carries on today as people saw in May this year uh, in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah uh, with the ongoing ethnic cleansing uh, of Palestinian uh, homes and territory by um, uh, Israeli Jewish settlers. So this is, that's what Zionism is. Right? Now of course everybody in the world now thinks that racism is a bad thing the University of Bristol itself has said that uh, racism must be dismantled and must be eradicated. And, you know, of course, I, I agree with that. And, uh, and, so, and what, we, what we talk about when, when we're ending an ideology like that is that we're removing the conditions for the existence of the ideology. Just like we were, we, we would talk about the ending of racism against black people or indeed uh, in relation to Islamophobia. Now, the, the wider question I, I've raised as well, though, it's not just the question of the the Zionist movement, which of course is centrally directed and uh, coordinated, uh, and you can see that in this country um, with, the, with the coordination that's been between the Bristol JSOC, uh, the Union of Jewish Students, the Community Security Trust, the Zionist Federation, the Jewish Leadership Council, the Board of Deputies, all of them have, have worked together, oh, and also of course the APPG on anti-Semitism, which is of course funded by Zionist uh, funders. So all of these organisations have worked together to, to call for me to be sacked. Um, they've, they've got together and, and campaigned over the course of almost three years now to get call for me to be sacked on the basis that I've said that the Zionist movement is an organisation which, which is hostile to, to world peace, which is hostile to um, Palestinian rights and which will do its best to try and undermine all of those who have anything to say about Palestinian rights and, and the, the, the justice of the Palestinian cause. What about those Jewish students who said they felt harassed and targeted by your rhetoric? What would you say to them? Well, there was no harassment. I mean, uh, I've said two general sorts of things. Uh, the first thing I said was that uh, I had been attacked and complained about by the head of the Jewish Society at Bristol and by the president of the UJS in London. And that was a, a matter of fact. It wasn't a matter of fact which was a secret. It had been put into the public domain by the head of the JSOC herself uh, on two occasions. And I was simply repeating uh, that uh, as a factual statement. I was saying that I'd been attacked and complained about. I had. Uh, and uh, the complaint uh, that they made against me was manifestly hopeless, was ridiculous, uh, and I was found not guilty of that complaint. Uh, so uh, so, so that, th there's no harassment there, right? That's simply a matter of fact. The other question of harassment, I guess, they would say is they would want to conflate that together with the, the, the arguments about ending Zionism. Well, they, you know, I'm sorry about that, but Zionism is an ideology which, in my view, is a racist ideology, and we should be campaigning to end that ideology, that, and that means if you look at my comments in full, that means that, or doing things like organising debates and, uh, and having the argument out about what Zionism is. Uh, you know, other people say, that, uh, the other side says, Zionism is about Jewish self-determination. Well, let's have that argument, but let's not say you can't mention Zionism as racism unless, and, and if you do, you'll be sacked. David, um, obviously this is going out to mainly Muslim audience. Um, your work pertains to how I mean, you basically say that um, Zionism as an ideology is racist and Islamophobic as well. Just explain to me, how is it uh, Islamophobic? So it, it's racist in the, in the sense of it, it had to justify the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, meaning the, uh, the uh, creation of settlements from the 1880s onwards, uh, then the, the, uh, the creation of the state of Israel itself through forced farms and through you know, uh, the, the, remo the Nakba, with the removal of three quarters of a million uh, of the indigenous people of Palestine. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's racist in the sense of continuing to do that, right? So that's, that's, that's anti-Palestinian racism, right? But they also uh, have to encourage the idea uh, of, uh, of, the, of the radical Muslim and that the Palestinian opposition is not a national liberation movement. It is instead, it's radical and Islamic and therefore, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, this is the kind of thing we should target. So it fits in very well with the war on terror rhetoric of, of post 9-11. And, and so that's the way in which, which Zionism needs to encourage Islamophobia and hatred of Muslims. And, um, and I, I got to that point, you know, from, uh, not from the, the, the theoretical idea that Zionism would have to do that, but from the empirical approach which we've taken, which is to follow the funding for Islamophobic groups. And I mean Islamophobic groups like the EDL uh, and the far right, but also the new conservatives. Uh, and, and similar other organisations who, who have, over the last 15, day, 15 years, uh, encouraged uh, hate crimes against Muslims, encouraged discrimination against Muslims, encouraged governments to institute racist policies, uh, racist counter-terrorism policies like the Prevent Policy in this country. That's a, uh, those, those kinds of things have been encouraged by 
uh, the Islamophobic organisations funded in, uh, in some in some senses, in, in some places, in large part by Zionist organisations. Now, that's not um, something which is controversial in the sense of it being untrue. Nobody has ever challenged any of the facts that we have produced showing the way in which uh, uh, pro-Israel uh, groups, especially in the US but also in this country, have funded uh, uh, Islamophobic organisations, as well as at, at the same time, of course, and uh, you'll, you'll not be surprised by this, as well as at the same time funding uh, settlements, uh, you know, directly funding settlements uh, in Palestine. After, you said this has been ongoing for about three years now, so ultimately you feel that the pressure campaign worked? It absolutely worked. I mean, uh, just, just to give you a part of history, the first complaint against me was made in April 2019 about a lecture I did in, in February 2019 about Islamophobia, not about uh, Israel, but Islam, about Islamophobia, where I referred to, to, the, to the work that I've done, the book I've published called What is Islamophobia, where we refer to the five pillars uh, of Islamophobia. And the first one, of course, being the state counter-terrorism apparatus, but then there are four social movements which encourage Islamophobia. One of them is the Zionist movement. Parts of the Zionist movement are engaged, directly engaged in, in fostering Islamophobia. So I, I said this. Uh, uh, there was a complaint from the Community Security Trust, uh, and then, then when that was rejected by the university because they had no locus, the CST encouraged the UGS and the Bristol JSOC to write a complaint. And the, the UGS wrote the complaint and the Bristol JSOC president signed the complaint. And that was rejected. And so they took that back again and they appealed that. And, and, the, and in the process, the, the university changed its rules, introduced the IHRA, and then reactivated the complaint, thinking that that would make it easier to find me guilty. And then after a, a long process, 18 months, in December 2020, uh, I was found conclusively not guilty in all of the charges by the QC who investigated this. Right. So that was a, a long process which failed. Uh, and uh, it was only some six or eight weeks six weeks later that the next uh, wave of complaints started which was which was the complaints about my comments on the 13th of February and that's what's led to me to be set, being sacked so that's like a, a three-year campaign run by the Bristol JSOX leadership the Union of Jewish Students the CST and a whole range of other uh, pro-Israel organizations so it worked. There's a I guess a parallel investigation being on into Stephen Greer uh, a professor at the University of Bristol he was accused of Islamophobia uh, an investigation was conducted by the authorities here. They um, they've not sacked him, but they've they've kind of taken away some of his teaching modules. I believe. Do you feel that there was a double standard here between your case and Stephen Greer's? I mean, I haven't seen the, the uh, investigation report. No one has. It's still confidential. Um, it looks to me from the press reports that he's been found not guilty of Islamophobia. They've removed one of his courses. Uh, I, I couldn't make a, a, a clear statement about whether there's a double standard in that particular case, but when one looks at the treatment of, um, of Islamophobia on campus more generally, one can say that there certainly is a, a double standard. Uh, the, when it comes to Israel and Palestine, the, the possibility of speaking out freely on campus is much more constrained than is the possibility of speaking out freely in favour of Israel and indeed uh, in favour of, uh, of discrimination against Muslims. So there's been ca there have been complaints on campus from the, the Black and Minority Ethnic Students Group about the the uh, about the university allowing people like the known Islamophobe Richard Kemp to come and talk on campus. And indeed, they had the former director of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, Yossi Kupavasser from Israel, uh, c uh, came to speak at the same meeting. Now, th this is a, an indication that, that there is a double standard, that, that Islamophobia is not regarded as so serious. And, and, and part, in part, that probably is because the, the head of steam which can be got up to campaign to raise the issue of Islamophobia is not as large as, as is the one which the, the pro-Israel groups are able to raise. What are the implications of this decision for freedom of speech on campuses around the country and specifically for Muslim and Arab students? Well, the implications are very, very grave. I, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I, I, you know, maybe someone can tell me I'm wrong about this, but I don't think there is a precedent for sacking a, a professor in a British university for uh, expressing views outside of work, expressing political views outside of work. I don't think there is a precedent. So this is a very, very grave precedent for freedom of speech and for academic freedom. Now, I hope that my appeal uh, against the decision will be successful. And if not, then the, an industrial tribunal will, will, will come to, to, to my aid. But it, it has a very, very grave effect, a chilling effect on academics across the country and indeed more widely. I mean, there are many, there are many cases in the US currently ongoing where academics have been had their, their um, uh, jobs denied or uh, been attacked 
by by the Zionist movement. So that that's that's problematic. In terms of the the, the status of of, um, of black and minority ethnic students, of uh, of Muslim students, of Arab students, of Palestinian students, it's very worrying. I mean, they, they in in the course of the investigation on, on me, the uh, Palestinian students were scared to speak out, uh, scared to, to make their views known because of the, the attacks they feared that would, that would come to them. People, uh, more generally, people who supported me have been uh, have been attacked on social media, have been trolled, have had their jobs threatened. So it's, it's a very dangerous uh, uh, sort of um, atmosphere to encourage that, that, um, that, that uh, students who are Muslim or Palestinian or Arab are not able to properly speak out about their political views, and if they do, that they can be they can be attacked on social media, and uh, as a result, they, they fall silent. So that's that's a situation which is which is institutionally biased against them, and you could say is a form of institutional racism. Final question, David: What does the future hold for you? Future for me uh, is that I will continue my work on Zionism. Uh, I will intensify my work on Zionism. Uh, I will have less distractions in terms of teaching and uh, administration jobs in the university and uh, people should watch this space for what's going to happen. It's over 20 years ago since I was at university now but I do remember that when I was there there was an atmosphere of well academic freedom you could say what you want the Islamic society was thriving we were talking about Bosnia we were talking about uh, the wars in the Muslim world but now whenever I go back to universities and especially university Islamic societies or even Palestinian societies there seems to be an atmosphere of censorship. They're really scared about speaking up, speaking their mind, inviting people who are really representing the grassroots Muslims of the United Kingdom, the Palestinian cause, etc., etc. There really is a stifling atmosphere in universities now. And I think David Miller's experience just pertains to that. Now, in terms of what the Zionists are doing, they're effectively going after employers. So if you're a Muslim activist and you want to speak your mind openly, within the law, but openly, and tell the truth about Palestine and Israel, then ultimately they're going to go after your employers, whether that's the public sector or the private sector, in a bid to shut you up, to shut you up on social media, to basically completely emasculate and neuter your activism. That is what's happening. And we're going to get to a point where the only Muslim activists um, who can can basically speak their mind are those who are self-employed and don't rely on you know employers to give them money now in terms of the implications for the Muslim community I think ultimately we really have to mobilize in support of those Muslims and non-Muslims who lose their jobs or who, whose livelihood is threatened just because they're speaking up for Muslims talking about Islamophobia talking about state Islamophobia state wars abroad, Zionism, etc, etc. It's imperative that we support these people because no one else will. And if we don't, the implications for us as Muslim activists, well, you know, it's catastrophic. Literally, we'll only be able to pray five times a day in mosques and do nothing else. It'll be an Islam devoid of politics. It'll be an Islam devoid of activism. So. People like David Miller, we've got to support him as a Muslim community. Yes, we're not going to agree with everything he says on every single issue, but ultimately we have more in common with him in terms of his, he's a guy who's literally lost his job because of his advocacy for the Muslim community and his advocacy of Palestine. Are we going to abandon people like that? I don't think we should.